different uh, renditions, translations of the scriptures for different purposes. So I certainly have a Bible that I think of as my study Bible and it's marked accordingly and I have a quite different Bible or Bibles <laughs> that I use for uh, devotional readings and then I have a different set of translations again that I use particularly for uh, the Psalms and the one Psalter that I use a lot and I think I used it last time is the Grail Psalter, a new, newer translation. But the interesting thing about this translation is that it already comes out or came out in two different versions. One for liturgical and devotional readings and another one for with a more exact translation of the Hebrew text the one for liturgical readings um, aims for a more poetic uh, rendering in English, picking up on the Hebrew, but translating, the strategy of translation is different. So I want to begin today with a, a psalm from uh, the Grail Psalter, uh, Psalm 148. And before I read it and pray it, uh, just an introduction to cue you into what I think is a key feature of this psalm and why I chose it for uh, this session. Psalm 148 is a hymn of praise. There is nothing strange about that given the Psalter. But in this particular psalm, the psalmist calls on everything created to worship God and situates human praise within that. Now, the psalmist relies on an ancient cosmology, obviously, um, and constructs with that a vast cosmic antiphonal choir, meaning a choir with two sides. And the two sides for the psalmist are made up of a choir that the psalmist envisions in the heavens. And then the second side of the choir, this antiphonal cosmic choir, is found on the earth. And that's of course where humans are located. I'll shorten the psalm a bit in that I cut off the detailed uh, list of various humans. Uh, for today, what is of greater interest to me is the listing of creatures um, that also praise God. Let us pray. Praise the Lord across the heavens, from the heights. All you angels, heavenly beings, sing praise, sing praise. Sun and moon, glittering stars, sing praise, sing praise. Highest heavens, rain clouds, sing praise, sing praise. Praise God's name, whose word called you forth and fixed you in place forever by eternal decree. Let there also be praise from the depth of the earth, from creatures of the deep, from fire and hail, snow and mist, storms, winds, mountains, hills, fruit trees, cedars, wild beasts and tame, snakes and birds, Men, women, old and young, praise. Praise the holy name, the name beyond all names. O people close to the Lord, let there be praise. Amen. Now on to the topic for uh, today. 
which is biblical roots of Christian worship. And it may seem to be a very straightforward and easy, seemingly easy topic. I tell you about practices of worship as they are found in the biblical witness. I'm going to do something different and complicate the issue. Hence, you have my visual aids, which are lots of question marks. And I think they are actually the number of um, headings, in a sense, by which I will walk you through the material. Six or seven larger questions. But to situate um, this session um, within the course on Foundations of Christian uh, Worship, if you think of last week as a kind of introductory uh, session ritually, I would say this is the gathering of the assembly. We enter today into the sanctuary of this course, uh, uh, more properly speaking, and we begin a large section of foundations of Christian worship uh, dedicated to foundational elements. In the second part of the course, we'll walk uh, more chronologically, um, think of it akin to from the upper room to cyberspace, and look at the development uh, throughout history and through different ecclesial traditions of patterns of worship. But for the beginning of this course, we are looking at uh, foundational elements that shape basically all or most Christian liturgical practices. And in some ways, uh, depending on which topic we are in, shape all ritual practices, whether Christian or not. For today, we, when we look at the biblical roots of Christian worship, uh, we really are talking about two ritual traditions, although in the end I will foreground the Christian tradition, but Christians share with uh, the Jewish community of faith um, a reference to the Hebrew Bible or in Christian parlance, often the Old Testament. Okay, let's begin with the first question. And in a sense it reprises a question I tried to get at last time. It is this, why worship and why gather with others for worship? The response on a very basic level is that the scriptures witness to the fact that worship of God is foundational to created existence. And by that I mean it's foundational to all creation as gifted into existence by God. And I include human beings in this. To put this differently, any answer to why do we worship will, for Jews and Christians, have to be rooted in their scriptures. And that is to say, rooted in our faith and its commitments, its sources, and its vision. And my foundational claim here would be that this leads us to creation because that is where the scriptures begin. I will have several footnotes as I walk through today, but I will mark them. So foot, this is the first footnote in a sense. Um, you could walk into a lecture on foundations of Christian worship and um, the question being, why do we worship? And it begins with what? You have several choices. It could be Jesus. It could be a pointer to Israel. It could be a pointer to Pentecost. A number of different options. So me choosing to begin with creation and rooting the question as to why we worship in creation is uh, 
peculiar. It's a, a peculiar choice I'm making, and I just want to flag that for you. If we open our scriptures, Genesis 1, a creation story. In recent re-readings by scholars, it has become very clear that Genesis 1 itself is already a liturgically inflected text, meaning there are ritual undertones to it, even if the word worship as such doesn't appear. And it is a poem, a creation poem, in which cosmos and creation and worship are intertwined. Anathia Portia Young, she is a, a scholar of the Hebrew Bible at uh, Duke, former colleague of mine there, puts it as follows. The cosmos God creates in Genesis 1 bears structural and artistic likenesses with the tabernacle and the temple, so later forms of sanctuary. And she continues to say that the portrayal of the cosmos in Genesis 1 is as a sanctuary writ large. So Genesis 1, if read that way, designates the cosmos in its entirety as a sacred site of worship. And that is, of course, exactly what we saw in Psalm 148, that everything created, the whole cosmos, is the primordial, we could say, sanctuary. Taking my cue from that biblical insight that opens our scriptures. I would root the primary question to why we worship in the biblical witness in such a way that I would say the scriptures actually open with the vision of a sanctuary, a cosmic sanctuary. Praise of God is primordially inscribed into our scriptures, into creation. And my argument then would be that in our Christian praying, in our practices of worship, no matter which ecclesial community you inhabit and claim as your own, we enter into God's presence in communion with all that is. Everything created by God as we are. Now, how might we theologically get to understanding and then hopefully living liturgy, worship, in this grand cosmic imaginary. For those of you who are interested in constructive theology, let me just sketch, I think, four or five quick steps as to how, if I had a whole um, course on how to theologically ground worship in creation, I would go about doing that. The first claim for Christians and for Jews would be that the universe is brought into existence not by chance, but by the creative energy of God. So a simple claim that God is creator, everything that exists is a creation on a 
footnote. Um, this is actually theologically a great equalizer because the rain and the worms that are coming out right now all happy about the rain and everything else in creation in its relationship to the creator stands on the same level that I do foundationally as created. More can be said, but there is a foundational equalizing force. A second step would make me claim that being created and called into existence is gift. And this gift of existence has as its telos, Greek word, its aim, its goal, its end, flourishing of what is created. And this is the reality <laughs> that turns everything created towards the creator in praise. So what I'm aiming to do is to link praise as the most basic form or one of the most basic forms of worship uh, into the structure of creation as the primary response in gratitude for the gift of existence. And I'm not talking only about human beings here. Third, a creation although deeply marred by sin, evil, and violence, continues to be God-sustained. So this takes, tries to take into account a narrative of the fall and its consequences with an appreciation of God's on, ongoing sustaining of God's creation. And with the next step, um, we enter into a particularly Christian claim that God, God self, entered this created but marred world in deepest intimacy in Jesus of Nazareth, living and dying as part of created reality. I'm very tempted to add another footnote here, um, but it would take too much time, so let me just flag it uh, for you. Um, theologically, in recent years, uh, theologians have, some theologians have begun to think about the incarnation in terms of deep incarnation, that God, in us claiming that God became a human being, we are actually claiming most basically that God becomes a created reality and enters not only human life but uh, all of created reality. And you can uh, uh, spin that out in, in more detail but for now I'll just um, flag that for you. And the final point of this theological sketch would be that everything God has created, the whole of creation, is on a journey through time to an ultimate fulfillment in God. And as the book of Revelation, parts of the book of Revelation at least, um, hint at that ultimate fulfillment of everything created will bring us back to primordial praise, joyful adoration and worship of God. So, what I've tried to suggest here is that worship is something infinitely larger than a group of nice human beings in a nice church building 
whether we look at it throughout a his historical trajectory or only in terms of contemporary practices. So the vision, my claim is, has to be a much larger one. That worship begins with God's creative energy, God's creative gift of life. Uh, what that means, of course, and we will talk more about that in another session uh, in this semester, is that the primordial shared space of worship is much vaster than any built, human-built sanctuary you might think of as your primary place of worship. Okay, so much for some thoughts on why worship and why I would want to root the answer in what I think of as primordial praise or the choir of creatures or all creation as a congregation. Second question. How can we anchor a vision of worship, and I don't only mean in terms of rooting it in creation here, but a Christian vision of worship. How can we anchor it in the scriptures. How can it be substantiated or verified? Now obviously with that we come to the biblical witness as an authorizing claim as inspired scripture let's say for Christians. What does that mean? Well, it means that when I talk of a biblical vision of worship, it is not something that you can verify in a petri dish or by other uh, scientific means. And sometimes, in fact, this may not be something verifiable in our daily experience at times. So if I claim that all creation is God-sustained, that the worship of um, Christians is spirit sustained and spirit inspired. Do I experience that every Sunday or every day in Marquand? Probably not. That sometimes takes a, a real act of faith. Um, C.S. Lewis has written beautifully um, about that uh, 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 disconnect in the screw tape letters, by the way. But then many ways in life are not open to scientific verification or to immediate verification by our sensory uh, perception. As Christians, um, the claim that we anchor and substantiate our faith in the scriptures and the scriptures as they have been read in community gathered for worship for centuries is, is that, a claim of faith that the scriptural witness is God's life-giving word. And so we approach the most important liturgical book, the scriptures, with an act of faith that through it, God has chosen to reveal God's self. And footnote number, I think I'm at three already. It is in fact worship, practices of worship that have given us our scriptures. Um, some of you will know, uh, some of you will learn in introductory courses 
um, that the canon of scripture, canon meaning the set books in the New Testament, in this case, um, was not closed until the fourth century, finally closed until the fourth century. In other words, the New Testament doesn't drop down from heaven on, at Pentecost. It's a set of books that is formed over time. And what's the formational power is worship. The scriptures are formed and end up in the canon based mostly on where the scriptures read over time in worship as inspired. And by the fourth century, we have a list that becomes final of these books. So in a sense, it is practices of worship that give us the scriptures, or gave us the scriptures. I want to stress again here something I said in passing, I think, in the last lecture, namely that the liturgical reading of scripture is different from the scholarly analysis of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, which often approaches them domin or approaches them dominantly as historical documents to be studied. A liturgical engagement and study of scripture will ask slightly different questions. How have the faithful lived and prayed with these texts? How have they been sung? How have they nourished people's faith throughout time? How did a medieval mystic like Julian of Norwich pray with these texts? How did Sojourner Truth ponder these texts? How did Aretha Franklin sing them? In a nutshell, I would say, all Christian traditions, whether they have written liturgical books other than the scriptures or not, whether the congregation is literate or not, the scriptures form the basic liturgical text in the sense of a written text of Jewish and Christian communities of faith. I think particularly in a highly literate context, uh, such as we find ourselves in, it's important to remember that an engagement with scripture for centuries was not wedded to literacy and continues for many communities of faith not to be linked to the whole congregation being literate. I think that's important to remember even in a highly literal culture like ours, because even in a culture like this, um, there are people in our congregations that do not engage the scriptures through literacy. Think of the newly born. Think of people with severe mental or bodily illnesses. People in a coma. They don't end up not being congregants just because they are in a coma. People with Alzheimer's. Um, and some people who are less than fully literate. So don't connect what I'm saying about the scriptures as a foundational text with everybody engaging that 
text through literacy. Um, we know from African American communities under slavery um, and other communities akin to that, that there was an oral, A-U-R-A-L, memory of the scriptures. In other words, people knew the scriptures outside of literacy. They knew them by heart. Uh, similarly, in early monastic communities, not everybody was literate, but praying the Psalms every day, you end up knowing them by heart very quickly. So there are, and of course, there are visual um, engagements with scripture. So think of scripture as more than a text that is only accessed through literacy. Okay? Do we have any Methodists here, self-avowed practicing? Great. So you will be familiar, I think, with the Methodist quadrilateral. Um, Methodists pride themselves in uh, this very uh, um, succinct, succinct formulation of what informs our faith, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Now, every Christian community has these categories in play, but not all of them name them openly like that. Um, these four, in a sense, shape all Christian communities of faith, but are weighed differently by different communities and at different times. And some Christian communities will, will vehemently deny that tradition has any authorizing function in their lives. Um, that is to be respected at the same time. Um, there are forms of tradition that inform those communities too. And at heart, it is a tradition of reading the scriptures. That's a tradition. Uh, that is older than the canon of scripture itself, as I just said. Okay. Question three. What do the scriptures, Hebrew Bible and New Testament for, script, uh, for Christians, tell us about worship? Well, beginning with Genesis 1, as I try to show at uh, the start of the lecture, worship is there, mapped into the deepest DNA, so to speak, of our scriptures. But in case you think it is only a story of praise and glory, um, I want to acknowledge uh, straight away that it is an ambiguous story, because the other of worship is ever since theologically the fall, uh, omnipresent. And what is the other of worship? It's idolatry. Still worship, but worship directed at something other than God. And so if you want to read more about that danger of uh, worship, um, a theologian called Matthew Meyer Bolton made an interesting claim some years ago. Um, he was, is heavily influenced by Karl Barth, the Swiss uh, theologian of the 20th century. Um, and he basically argued, he being Matthew Meyer Bolton, that worship is first and foremost humanity's act of sinfulness. So very different from my claim that worship is a, a primordial response to creation, um, to being created. His argument is that worship 
because of humanity's sinfulness, is always primarily in danger of being an act of sin in the sense of humans thinking they are reaching out to God. And that is, of course, one of the, the early um, insights of uh, Karl Barth that religion interpreted as humanity, human beings reaching out to God is the ultimate act of sinfulness because we cannot. Because of our sinfulness, it is God who has to encounter us before we can respond. I'm just putting that out there for you to uh, mull over. What I want to focus on is not the idolatrous act of worship, but worship as the primordial response to uh, God as a creator and how it as a positive act appears in scripture. First thing to say is that if we read the scriptures and say, what do we learn about worship? First thing to say it is that it comes in a multitude of forms. It is not one thing. And many of them we see develop and emerge over time. But there are some staples, so to say. A gathering of people for prayer. A sonic word, often song and music. And the instruments that appear are the instruments of their time. You will not find an organ in the Hebrew Bible. We find prayers of lament very early, so not everything is praise. We begin to have codified, patterned, written down prayers. Think of the book of Psalms as a collection of texts. We have holy places and holy people. We have forms of pilgrimage, of marking a place of as holy and journeying there. We have bringing gifts and sacrifices. We have forms of confession and atoning for wrongdoings. We have inspired utterances, prophetic words. We have incense. And we begin to see rhythms of prayer emerge, both in terms of daily rhythms, weekly rhythms already inscribed in Genesis 1 with Shabbat as the holy day of the week, and yearly rhythms. And with them come seasons of feasting and fasting. Another footnote note, simply to acknowledge that many of these elements I've just listed, and I basically went through a quick view of what would appear when you read, um, in this case, the Hebrew Bible. And it's not an exhaustive list. You can add your own as, as you go along. But many of these elements of a ritual of worship, of, of liturgical practices, Jews and Christians share 
with other faith traditions, be they Muslim, be they Hindu, be they indigenous. So many of these are basics of human ritualizing, one could say. And if I taught a whole course on the use of ritual studies for liturgical studies, we could delve into that in more depth. But for now, just another footnote. OK, question four, how to worship. If we say that the scriptures anchor pattern, authorize our Christian practices of worship. How do we go about taking the scriptures as authoritative and worshiping accordingly? Well, wars have been fought over this question. Let me suggest three different ways in which different Christian communities have authorized, thought to authorize their worship practices from the scriptures. And I'll simply label them in rather inelegant uh, basic terminology. But the first way of authorizing worship uh, through scripture, let's call biblicism. And a good example of that might be the New England Puritan communities. Basically, the authorizing narrative here is that nothing should be done in worship except what scripture explicitly authorizes. In other words, we will only worship or take over patterns and ways of worship if they have a biblical warrant for them. You end up with a small and clear, somewhat clear, list of what you can do in worship. What, you do, what can you do if you only take cues for your worship from scripture? Well, dominantly will be reading the biblical text and proclaiming it. Preaching the gospel. Prayer is allowed and authorized in the scriptures, but not prayers from prayer books other than the Bible. Singing is allowed especially or only really biblical texts. So you end up with wonderful metrical psalms being a staple uh, in these communities of faith. Baptism is clearly authorized in the scriptures and the Lord's Supper. <coughs> 
let's move to the second way and then it'll become clear where the differences emerge and what you wouldn't find in uh, Puritan communities. So let's name the second way, the, the middle way, the famous Anglican uh, via media, although it's not Anglican only. It's actually most Protestant mainline denominations these days. The authorizing narrative will go something like this. That worship can include things not authorized in scripture, as long as these are not forbidden, or contrary to the spirit of the Bible contrary to the spirit of the scriptures. So a middle way, you don't have to stay only with practices that the scriptures themselves mention, but nothing can be authorized in worship that is forbidden in scripture, or could be conceived of as contrary to the spirit of the scriptures. Some of you will recognize in the, that phrasing I've used here one of the roots of um, uh, contemporary uh, tensions and struggles in Christian communities of faith over um, same-sex marriage. There are virulent debates over uh, can we say that scripture is open to this or that it is n not contrary to the spirit of scripture? So none of these authorizing moves are easy. I'm not trying to claim that. I'm simply mapping for you conceptual ways of navigating how, very, how different ecclesial communities think differently about how their worship practices are rooted in scripture. None of them will say, oh no, we don't root them in scripture. They root them according to different, let's say, recipes. So the, the third one I would say is an expansive, not expensive, although it can be that too, but expansive with an A. And you will find this often in Catholic and in Eastern churches. And the narrative, if you press them into this category, would be something like this, that worship is an ongoing and living practice. Yes, it is rooted in the scriptures, but always growing as a community of faith journeys through time. And so there are liturgical elements and practices uh, that develop and go beyond anything the scriptures could or the world of the Bible could have imagined. Stained glass windows, organs, liturgical life in digital social space. You can try to root that directly in the scriptures, but there is some mediating steps you need to take. And so, of course, you can imagine a Puritan walking into um, a Catholic sanctuary, uh, seeing images and statues will say, the Bible doesn't authorize this, so it has to be idolatrous. When a Catholic will say, well, no, because on its journey through time, a faith community encounters different cultural contexts and an ongoing movement of the spirit with the community, and so what is prescribed 4,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago is, is not the only way in which God can be active. Okay, enough. Is, is that clear? You, you probably can tell by 
my slightly richer narrative of the expansive way of authorizing liturgical practices that that is my own tradition. So, um, But that's not the point. The point is uh, simply to map conceptually how to think about uh, different ways of authorizing liturgical practices. Yes? Um, I'm having trouble understanding the difference between the via media and the expansive narratives because I imagine that the expansive narrative would also hesitate to incorporate things that they believe are contrary to the spirit of the biblical narrative. Yes. So, so how do, where do you yeah. parse those apart? Um, there are, the, the long and short is there are porous boundaries. Uh, there are also, if one looks closely, porous boundaries between the biblicism and the middle way. Um, so is it more of a matter of uh, degree? Of emphasis in these communities? It's a matter of degree okay. also. And um, I think the, the main difference between two and three, the middle way and the expansive, is that um, number two would emphasize it doesn't uh, something can be incorporated into worship as long as it is not forbidden the, the expansive way takes that more broadly so for example let's take the veneration of saints or images. A middle way might say don't make graven images, although the middle way typically has also settled that in terms of um, that's, that's okay. So let me think about a different... Well, um, the middle way might conceive of some of the expansive, more expansive veneration of saints as coming close to what theologically would be called adoration, which is reserved for God. And so the, the middle way will stay away from coming too closely to a, a, a deep and rich veneration of saints and those who have gone before when the expansive way doesn't really worry about that other than to say we don't ever adore saints or those who have gone before. Adoration is a posture uh, towards God alone. Veneration is what is allowed towards places, saints, statues, uh, um, and so on and so forth, those who've gone before. Does that make sense? You don't, yeah, thank you. Okay. Any questions? Yes. So when you go through that list, um, you know, when you were talking about, like, you know, here's a, a list of what you see in the ritual, are there certain, would you say that there are certain ones of those that certain churches are more expansive, you know, even, for example, this is what I'm thinking, is that in some Protestant especially in non-denominational churches, they have changed baptism, whether it be mass baptisms or baptism by water slide, or like, it's a thing. Like, you know, they've changed that. That is a more expansive view than the Catholic version of baptism. Ah, uh, yeah, this isn't so much about expansive uh, contemporary ritual practices. Okay. Um, I I don't think most evangelical communities um, would say, okay, can we use water slides in baptism? Let's lo look at the New Testament and see whether we can authorize that. Right. Okay. Um, th that's not the the argument. Okay. Um, those are. Um, it's an interesting question. How would, where would you place those things? There are, I would say this, and maybe there is another class to be taught here related to this. There are a lot of contemporary 
um, features, elements, media that have journeyed into Christian worship without people saying, can I authorize this from scripture? Even very Protestant communities of faith. Um, umbrellas. Um, water slides for baptism. Um, icons even have made it into uh, sacred spaces that 500 years ago would have not had them on biblical grounds. So maybe with contemporary media we, we need to create a whole new set of categories. Uh, that's, that's a good point. This wasn't so much about a question about how much stuff is there in contemporary worship. It's a theological question. How do communities, if they want to claim our worship is authorized by scripture, how do they move? And the water slides and the umbrellas and lots of balloons. No, people don't usually say, oh, let's, let's start reading Genesis and find out whether balloons appear anywhere between Genesis and Revelation. Okay, one last question, then we need to move on. Sorry, this was clarification. So the expansive way they would try to find uh, some kind of authorization, maybe permission maybe, or, you know, something like that, whereas yes. maybe these modern forms of which you say, you know, it's fun, let's Yeah, it. exactly. It, it brings in a crowd. All right. It, it makes worship vibrant. Um, yeah, I could say a whole lot more about the ex how the expansive functions. If you're interested in this, I'm teaching a class on Catholic liturgy next semester. That's the place to think about how expansive um, c can you get and how deeply and long do you have to read the scriptures before devotion of Mary pops up and becomes imaginable and legitimate. Mm -hmm. So, okay, question five. What is central in the biblical witness to worship? What is central? Well, it's not particular uh, texts of prayer or any form, any particular instruments, any of the lists I've given you, what is at the heart of the biblical witness, I would say, to worship is a quite particular God. And it is a God who speaks all creation into being and calls human beings a, a covenanted people to hear God's voice. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Listen, Israel, 